Thank you so much for those presentations. So unfortunately, we do not have Tomoki here because of the time difference in Japan, uh, but we do have Dr. Van Dijk. Um, and I know your internet is a little bit uh, iffy, so we're going to hope for the best and see how we go. OK, so the first question is, um, it's a two-parter. If um, someone has a mutation in COL12A1, does it automatically result in a diagnosis of MEDS? And what about if someone has a variant of unknown significance on COL12A1? So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, because, of course, we always explain to our patients as well that you can have uh, different types of changes. You can have, like, clearly disease-causing changes. You can have changes that are likely benign. And you can have variants of unknown significance, which we all sometimes call, like, a question mark result. We're not sure whether the change actually causes myopathic disease, yes or no. So how to find out more is sometimes it depends on the type of um, gene alteration that's found, but you can do, for example, uh, functional studies and look, uh, for example, at the, at the cDNA um, to see whether there is an effect on the protein. So it, it, it depends very much on the specific gene alteration that has been found. Thank you. And what differentiates MEDS from other forms of EDS with myopathy or myopathic features? Um, I th it's... I think it's it's a diff it's a difficult question to answer really because I think the um, the myopathic EDS is just we don't know it for so, such a long time and as you might have seen also in the presentation the sort of the criteria are still quite broad and I think that sort of as we see and get to know more people with myopathic EDS we can de define the criteria better and also then uh, make a better distinction between uh, sort of with regard to people, other people with uh, other types of EDS, but also distinction between other um, myopathies, for example. I think there's still a lot to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Could you be more specific concerning respiratory surveillance and are individuals at risk for nocturnal hyperventilation and eventual daytime res respiration type 2 failure? Yeah, <clears throat> I think I think the sort of the management guidelines they, they were like extrapolated from uh, the care for people for, uh, for people do, who have a diagnosis of Bethlehem myopathy. So it's it's really I would say I would say for children, yes, I think you you should monitor when they're really young and potentially, of course, when they have a res the recessive type of a myopathic EDS, but. It's, it's really difficult to give advice for the adults. So what I would always say is that it probably for patients who have just been diagnosed, it's best to be referred to a neuromuscular specialist. Um, so for example, a neurologist who has expertise in neuromuscular disease to see what, what actually need to be managed, what actually the problems are. Is there myopathy? Is there, is there severe myopathy? Are there uh, respiratory problems? Um, do we need to uh, organize surveillance for it? Because there is no clear guidance yet. So it's also, I think, a plea. What I would sort of uh, want to do is if people are diagnosed with myopathic EDS and are seen by neuromuscular specialists, whether they can remain sort of under surveillance, not being discharged, also to just follow them up and see how, um, how the, what kind of symptoms they have and what needs to be addressed. Because I think there's really a lack of a lack of knowledge. Um, Thank noticed. you. How much do we know about the molecular pathophysiology of um, MEDS? MYEDS. So, yes. So I think what we do know is that, um, as I explained also in the presentation, sort of recessive variants that cause like strongly reduced production of col 12 a one give a more severe phenotype. We know that there are, um, for example, glycine substitutions in the col 12 a one gene, which can give you like the moderate severe phenotype and the same for certain splice size variants in the col 12 a one um, And apparently there is also changes um, 
molecular changes that cause arginine to cysteine substitutes, which seem to be a bit more, um, which gives you a more uh, a less severe phenotype. So there is there is already some knowledge, and there is so you can already sort of speak a bit about the genotype phenotype relationship. But again, nineteen individuals is not a lot, and I think we really need to know more. So it's it's just starting. I would say the knowledge uh, about this condition. Thank you, and thank you so much uh, to your presentation for your presentation. Okay, we're now going to move on um, to our next section of the conference. Thank you.